Thank you so much for being here. It, it is, uh, it's an honor to be on the stage today, a true honor. And it's great to have Andrew Natsios, the former uh, administrator of USAID and the current director of the Scowcroft Institute, welcome you because Andrew does a phenomenal job for the Bush School, for Texas A&M, and I think for the country and keeping conversations going that are important to have. Um, I'm noticing that there are a number of former presidents of Texas A&M University sitting in the audience. Would all of you please stand? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Th thank you so much for being here. Well, our principal guest today is a Kansas boy. He's also an Eagle Scout, something he's very proud of. As you know, he's kept, on a life, kept up a lifetime relationship with the Boy Scouts of America, actually served as chairman of the Boy Scouts of America for a number of years, still works almost full time with the Boy Scouts and staying connected. Uh, he graduated from the College of William and Mary, which is where he got his bachelor's degree from, uh, a great, great and long distinguished college. Uh, he is also the first graduate of that college in the modern era to eventually become chancellor, which he, the role he assumed in 2012 and still serves in as the chancellor of the College of William and Mary. He got his master's in history from Indiana University, uh, which is also where he got his hook from the CIA. Um, and so he thinks of that place fondly. And then, of course, he has his PhD in Russian and Soviet history from Georgetown University. And I think that has served him well over the years. He began his career, I think, appropriately for all really great Americans as an intelligence officer in the United States Air Force. <laughs> he, he, then, he then moved to CIA full time after they uh, helped him get into the Air Force. And then from 1966 to 1993, he spent 27 years serving his country as an analyst at the Central Intelligence Agency. And he rose through every analytical rank and position you could have at CIA. He spent nine of those 27 years working at the National Security Council in some capacity. Uh, in 1986, he became the deputy director of Central Intelligence Agency, which typically is about the highest uh, uh, level you could uh, uh, aspire to as an analyst in CIA. He served there until 1989, and then moved back to the National Security Council staff, where he served as assistant to the president and as deputy national security advisor from 1889 to 91. He then went back to CIA when he became the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, the first entry-level employee to rise through the entire organization to direct that phenomenal intelligence organization. I think that's a remarkable career achievement all by itself. Um, when he left the CIA in 93, he spent the next six years working on corporate boards, lecturing at universities literally across the country, and of course working on his first book, From the Shadows, which he published in 1996. I hope we'll talk a little bit about books later because he's written three phenomenal ones and is about to complete his fourth. From 99 to 01, he was the interim dean of the George H.W. Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University. The first real full-time dean of, of the school, although he was an interim and was expecting to keep the job for a couple of months, two years later, he managed to escape. Um, and then shortly thereafter, returned to Texas A&M in 2002 as the president of Texas A&M University. Can I get a whoop? <laughs> And then after four years here at the university, in December of 2016, he got the call to public service once again and was asked to return to Washington, D.C. and serve as our Secretary of Defense, which he did for five remarkable years. And during that period, he actually transitioned from one president to another, remaining as Secretary of Defense, the first time that's ever happened in the history of our country, and ended up with him serving eight different U.S. presidents in the course of his remarkable public service career. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Secretary Robert M. Gates. <laughs> Thanks for Thank you. Thank you. It really is great to Howdy. have you here, sir. <laughs> So what have you been up to since you left public <laughs> service? <laughs> well, uh, I've been watching the circus. Uh, uh, um, and maybe importantly for the students here, uh, I, I just retired last year from the board of directors of Starbucks. Um, <clears throat> 
and I have the most coveted gift of all, a lifetime Starbucks pass. Uh, and uh, I've been writing another book. Uh, I'm in uh, a consulting business with Condi Rice and former National Security Advisor uh, Steve Hadley. And uh, still doing a lot of speaking. And Chancellor uh, William Mary, as you mentioned. Uh, so, you know, keeping fairly busy for a retired guy. I, <laughs> I was in Germany last week. I was in New Delhi two and a half weeks before that, in Europe uh, in September. So, you know, managing to keep out of my wife's hair. <laughs> when I retired the first time out of CIA in uh, 1993, uh, her line to me was, for better or for worse, but not for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so keep busy. <laughs> It, it, I, don't want the, I don't want the former director of Central Intelligence helping me organize my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, we've got all these former presidents of the university here, so I know. It's pretty intimidating, actually. It's pretty intimidating. <laughs> is there anything you remember from your time as president that, that really has stuck with you? <laughs> there are a lot of things. I actually, I mean, what I would have to say, um, the four and a half years that I was uh, president here, um, I'm, I can say with some confidence was the most fun job I ever had. And it was certainly the most fun job I ever had as far as my wife is concerned. Because <laughs> she loved Texas A&M and you may or may not know the Children's Center here is named for her uh, with a statue of her out in front. But, uh, so I was joking uh, with, uh, with Mark behind stage, Becky is unique uh, she is a unique woman in many ways, but especially unique in that she is the only woman in America who uh, has a children's center at a major university named for her and is also the sponsor of a nuclear attack submarine. <laughs> <laughs> she keeps trying to figure out how to bring those two together. <laughs> in, in truth, all men love a dangerous woman. <laughs> Um, so this, this is the first time you've been back to A&M since President Bush died. Yes. I know you actually came earlier today and visited the grave site. Um, anything out, out here, there are a number of Bush School students, there's a number of students from A&M, there's a number of public servants. Anything that you recall from uh, your memories of President Bush, because you knew him very well, um, that people should keep in mind as they go back to their day of public service? Well, I think, I would say two things beyond all of the things that were said um, around the funeral and so on. And um, I think one is that here's this man who held all these powerful positions. But, but the, one of the things that was most marked about him was uh, how kind he was and how he treated everybody with respect and dignity. And he, he cared as much and asked as much about the families of, of uh, the groundskeepers and the housekeepers in the White House as he did of his cabinet officers. Uh, and he would play horseshoes with uh, some of the household staff and they would have a contest and so on. I mean, he, he just was a genuinely warm, decent human being. The other thing is he just had an amazing sense of humor. Uh, he was actually hilarious to work with. And, you know, particularly in 89 to 91, when we were going through the liberation of Eastern Europe and the reunification of Germany and the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, the Gulf War, except for the Gulf War, the way he dealt with stress was laughter. And, and there are just so many pictures of all of us laughing uproariously. And, and I often thought, you know, if people knew how much laughing was going on in the situation room, they'd think we were all in very much the wrong place. But that's the way sane people deal uh, with unbelievable stresses. And I'll tell you one story that I told some of the students from the uh, Scowcroft Institute, <clears throat> which seems entirely appropriate. President Bush created an award for the American 
participant in a meeting with the President of the United States who most obviously fell asleep. <laughs> and, he, and he named it for his national security advisor, the Scowcroft Award, <laughs> because Brent had many oak leaf clusters. <laughs> And he evaluated you on three criteria. First was duration, how long did you sleep? Second was depth, snoring always got you extra points. And the third was quality of recovery. Did you just quietly come back to consciousness and open your eyes, or did you wake with a jolt and knock the coffee over? But well, he had a lot, of, he was an amazing, wonderful person to work for. Thank you, sir. Yeah, people here miss him. It's good to have him close, though. Um, I read the paper this morning. Also, I might say, <laughs> he also converted me to vodka martinis. <laughs> <laughs> Another contribution to national defense I hadn't heard. No. I, I was reading the paper this morning, which is going to be a depressing thing. Um, it, you, you mentioned the circus. Uh, hearings start today on the Hill. What do you think about this impeachment thing? Well, it's hard to make any sort of unique observations. Uh, I guess what I would say is um, that, I mean, I was, <laughs> I joined the NSC for the first time four months before Richard Nixon resigned. As I like to say, I, I signed on as a deckhand of the Titanic after it hit the iceberg. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but I mean, my worry—I would—I I would like to expand it in this way. We have a lot of really serious problems facing this country, and and my worry is that this process will not only further polarize the Congress, which seems pretty hard to do at this point, but will also further distract them. So all of the military services right now have really impressive modernization programs going forward. If the Congress doesn't pass a defense appropriations bill in the next two weeks, all of those programs will come to a screeching halt. Because under a continuing resolution, you can't start anything new. So my point is, you know, I, I personally think that at a minimum, what happened with Ukraine was dishonorable. Um, and as, as was said many years earlier, many years before now, you know, impeachment is basically whatever the Congress says it is. And so I, I don't know whether this um, is worth it. I'm concerned that it's happening a year before the election. In both Nixon and Clinton's case, cases, they had both already been reelected. So the impeachment process took place uh, after uh, the, the national election. So, you know, I'm, I'm Mark, I'm kind of hard pressed to figure out uh, what the right path forward is. I, but I do know what the consequences are going to be. And that is further polarization and distraction and not getting the people's business done. Um, I think it will be a um, unfortunate if this ends up being a purely partisan undertaking. Um, I mean, the, the Republicans were very uh, forthright about uh, their opposition, or they're their telling Nixon he was not going to survive a vote. Um, there were a number of Democrats who uh, voted to impeach President Clinton. Um, but a, a wholly partisan impeachment process, I guess I would have to say, uh, I understand the desire of people to hold the president accountable, um, but what's the cost? 
So, so you mentioned the elections. The candidates who are already running in earnest for 2020, are they focused on the right issues? Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, I, I think they're, first of all, I think that, and, you know, I mean, the only, I mean, everybody knows what, well, I guess everybody doesn't know what President Trump's positions are, but, <clears throat> but on the Democrat <laughs> side, I mean, in my opinion, some of the candidates are putting forward proposals that have zero possibility of being enacted. And, and, and so why, why end up focused on things that are basically pipe dreams politically rather than on putting forward proposals to deal with the actual problems we have? Um, whether it's immigration or public schools or infrastructure or, you know, where is, the, where is the politician who is saying to the people of Ohio and West Virginia and Michigan uh, and the upper Midwest in general, um, because of technology and globalization, those jobs, your manufacturing jobs are never coming back. And here's my program for retraining, for using community colleges, for apprenticeships, uh, and retraining uh, middle-aged workers to find you a new career path that has dignity and a living wage. I mean, where, I mean, all these people are suffering. And, and where are the people saying, here's how I think, um, the Affordable Care Act could be changed or improved or whatever to make it better and more effective. But it seems to me that, that some of these radical proposals are, are just whistling in the wind. There's just, I mean, even, even you, you talk to Democrats on the Hill, there's no chance any of these are ever gonna be passed. I remember one, one of the uh, um, progressives being interviewed and the interviewer was actually a fairly friendly interviewer and said, you know, we've added up the cost of the Green New Deal, the cost of Medicare for all, the cost of free college education for everybody and everything, and it comes to $21.5 trillion. And we've added up all the tax cuts, all the tax increases that you want, let's assume they all get passed, that raises $2.5 trillion. Where are you gonna get the other $19 trillion? It was just kind of a blank look. So it seems to me that, um, and, th and then I guess I would make one other observation. I don't hear any of the candidates talking about the importance of bringing Amer Americans together, about how we begin to repair uh, the divisions among us, how we begin to deal with the reality that we're all in this together and that we're gonna to have to work together to make it, to make progress in this country, to overcome a lot of these problems. I don't, I don't hear any unifiers out there. Everybody is trying, all the candidates that I see are trying to divide, and that's across the spectrum. And, and it seems to me maybe that's one of the most important things they ought to be talking about. As a former cabinet member, a longtime member of the National Security Council, does it bother you a little bit that the White House staff meeting has been replaced by Twitter? <laughs> well, I should go back to my previous answer. You know, another interesting aspect of all the debates and all of the, di all the campaigns so far is nobody's talking about foreign policy. We've got China, we've got Russia, we've got Iran, we've got North Korea, we've got ISIS, we've got Turkey, we've got NATO. I mean, we've got all these problems and no one is saying a word, and we're not to mention the fact we're still in war in Afghanistan, and nobody's talking about foreign policy at all. Um, you know, I've watched, as you mentioned, I've watched eight presidents um, uh, make policy and make decisions in their own way. I think that the problem 
with decision making by Twitter is it's, it's often a good idea to surprise your adversaries. It's probably generally not a good idea to surprise your own staff. Um, and, and especially those who are then going to have to go out and defend the decision or make it work. So that would be my concern is that it, it, there's no filter. And, and, you know, I've sat in, and most presidents don't like to be disagreed with, but they understand the importance of having people around them who will. Uh, 41 was, that was especially true of 41, but I would say it was true of both Bush, and, this second Bush and Obama as well. Um, and, and uh, so I think, I think that, uh, it's very hard. Uh, one of the things that troubles me about Washington generally is the absence of a strategy for dealing with anything, and that's not new with this president. But it's especially hard mm -hmm. to make strategy on Twitter. I think we should talk about foreign policy. <laughs> you know, you, you, your roles as director of Central Intelligence and Secretary of Defense really do give you a unique window on the world of foreign policy, national security, global security. What is your number one concern when you look at the U.S. and global security in general? Well, in all honesty, I think, I think that the greatest threat to national, the national security of the United States right now can be found within the two square miles that encompass the Capitol building and the White House. And I, and I don't mean that facetiously. If we can't figure out a way to come together and begin to address some of the nation's really big problems. That's a bigger threat to us in the future than Russia or China or any of these others. Uh, what happens in the relationship with China in terms of a competition has a hell of a lot less to do with what happens in China than what happens in the United States. If, if, if we are perceived to be in decline, that's a problem for us to solve. Nobody else caused that. And so, but outside of that, I would say that um, the most important ongoing relationship for a long time to come will be the relationship with China. And, and I think what people are coming to grips with was that the assumption that we have made for 40 years that a richer China would be a freer China was wrong. And, and now, one of the great ironies is, I think about the only place where there is bipartisan agreement in Washington is on China, and it's hostile. And I've always compared the American government to a dinosaur. It has a little tiny brain <laughs> and no fine motor skills. <laughs> So I'm afraid we're going to overreact too far in the other direction with China and not understand that, first of all, this relationship has to be kept peaceful and, and that this competition will take place in the non-military uh, arenas, economic, technological, intellectual, uh, and so on, strategic communications. And, and one advantage they have that we don't is they have a strategy. So I think, I think China will be a preoccupation no matter who is president. And the challenge will be keeping that relationship competitive or as a rivalry and not letting it slide over into being completely adversarial and possibly uh, resulting in military confrontation. But there, I, I listed off a few minutes ago, I mean, there's a lot of different challenges uh, out there that we face. Um, and, and, but I think, I think China is the biggest one overseas. We continue to face a metastasizing terrorism um, that is kind of Al-Qaeda 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. Um, and, and we will always have to be alert to them. So is China's approach to become a recognized regional power? Do they have a grander scheme in mind, or does that even matter to us when we set our 
foreign policy goals these days? Well, I think China seeks military dominance in Asia. Um, and within a couple of years, they will have about 300, and you've probably got better information on this than I do, but about 350 uh, Navy ships and submarines in that region, and we will have about 70. Now, we have allies, of course, uh, but we're treating them pretty cavalierly, but that's another issue. Uh, I think, I, so I think China seeks re, regional military dominance. I think that they see themselves as a global power, competitive with the United States in every arena. And, and what we have seen under Xi Jinping that we have not seen since Mao is essentially the offer of an alternative path to development for other countries and that is authoritarian state capitalism. It sure as heck isn't communism, but authoritarian state capitalism. And in a lot of developing countries in particular, it has a lot of appeal. And authoritarianism itself has appeal even in Europe, as we've seen in Hungary uh, and little tendencies in Poland and, and some other places. So, so I think that we're in for a very long competition with China. They have a lot of problems, a lot of challenges, including demography. But, but I think they are, this is, this is comparable in some ways to the Cold War with Soviet Union in the, in the sense that my hope is it will not be military and will be confined to the non-military instruments of power. But the Chinese are significantly richer and in my view, smarter than the Soviets ever were. So it will be a much more intense competition. And we will, we will not have as one-sided an advantage in these non-military instruments as we did during the Cold War. Because the truth of the matter is, the Soviet Union was a very one-dimensional power. It was a military power, and that was about it. That is not the case with China. So are there any uh, specific principal foreign policy goals you would set? relative to China? Well, I think, I think that, um, first of all, I, I thought that Trump's challenging the Chinese on, on their trade practices mm -hmm. was the right thing to do. But I worry that, that we've gotten diverted from the real issues to tariff issues, to the, to the trade balance. And, and I think that's of secondary importance. What's important is what some of his people have talked about and occasionally he's talked about. And that is uh, their theft of intellectual property, their, their unfair rules on joint investments, their restrictions on foreign investment, their subsidies of state-owned enterprises. I mean, all of these are structural. And the irony is fixing these problems in terms of our bilateral relationship ironically would benefit China for the long term. And the other point I would make is if you're gonna challenge China on these structural issues that means China has to make some real changes inside, we would be in a, I believe we'd be in a lot stronger position if the Chinese were on that side of the table and on our side of the table in addition to us was the EU and Japan and, and others that basically says we're the, develop, we're the developed world and these are the fair rules that we, we apply to each other and we're going to apply them to you. And my view is on a lot of these things is we should have one simple demand, reciprocity. If you only will allow minority ownership in certain kinds of companies, fine. That'll be the rule here for Chinese companies here in the United States and so on. Okay. Um, there is a narrative that's been around for probably five to eight years now that we don't need to worry too much about China because their internal problems will eventually overtake them and, and they'll slow down this development and their progress, whether it's demographic problems that they have with the Uyghurs and other groups or it's lack of, uh, of economic development in the western part of the country um, or lack of ability to find any real regional allies and partnerships. Do you, do you think that's a valid narrative? It doesn't seem well, to slow them see. down yet. Chi the Chinese have been around for 4,000 years. 
Um, granted, they had a couple of bad centuries. Um, but I think betting on outlasting the Chinese is not a very good bet. <laughs> But <laughs> we've been around for a little less than 300. Yeah. What's They've had almost as many bad years as we've had our whole history. <laughs> What's going on in Hong Kong? Well, the problem, and we were talking about this a little bit at lunch, the problem that I think, well, the problem, in, in, uh, the, the problem is clearly China trying to encroach on the agreements that were made when the handover was made from the UK to, um, to China. So that's the root of the problem. But in terms of where we go from here, it seems to me that the problem is that it's similar to what um, the Egyptian government faced in January of 2011 in Tahrir Square. And when I would call Field Marshal Tentawi, the defense minister, and encourage him not to use troops and to negotiate. He said, the problem is there are no leaders. This is just a mass uprising and there's, no, there's nobody who speaks for any of them or for more than a handful. And that's the way, that's the situation in Hong Kong right now is there's nobody to sit down across from Carrie Lam who can actually negotiate anything and have matter because he or she will only basically be speaking for themselves. So I think this is why this is such an intractable problem. Uh, the, the unrest and everything is because there's nobody in charge. And, and it's sort of a hydra-headed uh, uh, thing that has, has uh, grown up. And, and unfortunately, the longer it goes on, it'll, it almost becomes a habit. Oh, it's Saturday, it's time to go out again. And, and so I... <laughs> When I was in the intelligence business, I always used to divide everything we wanted to know into two categories, secrets and mysteries. The secrets were the things that were knowable and potentially stealable. Mysteries were the things where you nor the protagonist had any clue how it was gonna turn out. What happens in Hong Kong is a mystery, not a secret. <laughs> so the pivot to Asia, the, the Obama administration, the Trump administration are still continue to talk about pretty uh, clearly. Is, is it still a good idea? Well, the problem is that the pivot to Asia, as far as I'm concerned, was primarily uh, rhetorical, and to the extent it had any content, ended up being military. Uh, if there was a pivot to Asia, I think Obama made a terrible mistake in not agreeing to join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. All of our allies did. And the irony is it would have given us, that bank is funding a number of the Belt and Road projects that the, of the Chinese. And being a member of the bank actually might have given us a say in how some of those projects were conducted and even potential contracts for American uh, construction companies. So refusing to join that uh, investment bank, I think was a huge mistake by Obama uh, I think quitting the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a huge mistake by President Trump. So if, we, if we're pretending to ourselves that we're pivoting to Asia, we have a kind of a screwy way of showing it because the pivot to Asia, as best I can tell, mainly is represented by a bunch of, a bunch of Marines in Darwin, Australia. <laughs> I think we should pivot to Russia. <laughs> What's Vladimir Putin up to? I think it's pretty easy uh, to figure out what, what Putin is up to. I think he's got, I think he's had a couple of objectives from the very beginning. And one was, <clears throat> well, one was to reestablish internal control in Russia because by the time Yeltsin stepped down in 99, um, there were, the, the, the federal regions were not paying any attention to the central government at all, not paying taxes or anything. And the oligarchs basically had taken control of the country, the economy. So Putin's first two moves were to reestablish authority uh, over both. And that paved the way for the kind of authoritarianism that you see uh, in, in, uh, in Russia today. In terms of foreign policy, I think Putin's first objective is <coughs> clearly to restore Russia to uh, the great power status that it had uh, before the Soviet Union collapsed. And 
that is uh, why he's gone into Syria. And frankly, I think he's played his cards very well. So now we have a flipped situation in the Middle East where, where the Americans used to be the only party that talked to everybody. Now it's the Russians. And now you have all the people in the Middle East, all the leaders in the Middle East, beating a path to Moscow, not to Washington. Benjamin Netanyahu has been to uh, Moscow more in the last two years than he's been to Washington. He sat by Putin at the Victory Day parade last May. The King of Saudi Arabia has been to Moscow. Crown Prince has been several times. Um, Crown Prince of the UAE has been there. Erdogan has been there a number of times. So Putin has reestablished Russia's place in the Middle East that was denied them by Henry Kissinger in 1972. So they're back. Uh, and they're trying to do the same thing elsewhere. So reestablishing Russia as a, as a great power. Second, traditional Russian strategy, create a buffer of friendly or friendly states or frozen conflicts on the periphery of Russia to keep the enemies at, at a distance. Clearly done that by the actions in Georgia, uh, in Ukraine. Um, he's menacing Belarus. And you have significant Russian populations living in uh, the three Baltic states. So I think he has to be watched very carefully uh, on that front. Since 2012 and 2014, when he believes the US, in the first instance, interfered with his election in Russia, mainly because of negative statements that Hillary Clinton made as Secretary of State about the freedom of the election in 2012 that was used by a lot of demonstrators in Moscow and elsewhere. And then what happened in Ukraine in 2014, where uh, basically a street mob threw out uh, Putin's man Yanukovych, he regarded as a coup. And I think really from that time, and maybe even from the color revolutions in 2004, 2005, Putin has become convinced that all the US efforts to try and promote democracy and human rights and so on, basically are aimed at regime change in Russia. And so he has decided he will do everything in his power to create political problems in the West. And not just in the United States, he was involved in the Brexit vote. The Russians were involved in the Brexit vote. They loaned Marie Le Pen 10 million euros for her mm -hmm. campaign in France. Uh, they're messing around in Belarus. They're messing around in Montenegro. Um, and so I think, and it's not just to try and influence elections, because that's really hard to do even, even using cyber. But I think it's more to to delegitimize democracy in the West by turning people against one another, using fake news, using uh, bots and plants and all kinds of things to create problems. Uh, and I think we will see this continue on the part of the Russians so that he's in a position essentially to tell his own people, see, they're no better than we are. And, and I think he's particularly got his uh, experts working on ways to further divide the American people on race issues and a variety of things to exacerbate uh, problems that are already there. So I think those are his three major strategies now. He has no strategy for where Russia should be in the 21st century internally. Um, you know, as far as he's concerned, the oil and gas will last as long as he does, and, and um, why bother with other economic development? Nobody's interested. So I think, I think that's what he's about. He is extremely ruthless. Um, and if you're a dissident in Russia today, or an opponent, um, you're a lot less likely to end up in the gulag than you are being shot to death on a snowy bridge outside the Kremlin or poisoned in London. For the students in the audience, there is literally nobody in our country who has spent more time looking at this issue throughout the course of a career than Secretary Gates has. Uh, this is where he started life. Um, sir, so what should our foreign policy goals be relative to Russia? 
Well, I think that the one thing that started under President Obama and has been worsened under President Trump is failing to recognize the unique asset for the United States represented by our allies. Uh, both Russia and China have clients, but no allies. And this is a unique strength that we have had. And believe me, nobody's gone harder at the Europeans on their failure to pony up uh, what they should for their own defense than I have. But I told an audience my last speech at NATO, I told an audience in Brussels, I said, I'm the last senior American official you will ever encounter who has an emotional attachment to NATO because I remember the role during the Cold War. But a new generation of politicians is coming to power in the Congress and in the White House who do not have that emotional attachment. And they will look at this relationship as a cost-benefit analysis, and you will come up short. That was in 2011. So the Europeans, to a degree, have themselves to blame for this. Uh, and they have been free riding. On the other hand, they have made some very significant contributions. And a lot of those allies were with us in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and a lot of young European men died in those countries alongside our own soldiers. And they do provide uh, very useful uh, assets for us militarily, as you know better than anybody. <clears throat> so I think, I think one of the most important priorities for us in foreign policy is to cultivate or to recultivate these relationships, keep the pressure on because they do need to do their part, but to, to reassure them that we will fulfill our commitments and that we have their back. My concern now, and you're seeing it first in the Middle East, and I just referred to it, is that when countries come to believe they can't rely on their relationship with the United States for their own security, that they begin to look for alternatives. And that's why Erdogan is buying Russian uh, surface to air missiles. It's why the leaders in Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Turkey are all flocking to Moscow. It's why the Prime Minister of Israel is going to Moscow. People are beginning to look around and say, okay, if I can't count on the United States, who do I count on in a very hostile world? So I think um, doing some repair work on, on our alliances because at the end of the day, on a lot of the issues we, that matter to us, their cooperation is important whether it's trade issues or, or sanctions on Iran or, or a host of other things. So I think that's a big priority. I think figuring out what our strategy is going to be toward China. I think, again, we talked a little bit about this at lunch. I think one of the most serious things that's happened to the United States in terms of foreign policy since the end of the Cold War is that we essentially with the disappearance of the Soviet Union dismantled virtually all <clears throat> of the non-military instruments of power that helped us win the Cold War. Strategic communications, I mean, we don't have anything like USIA today. When I left government in 1993, USAID had uh, 15,000 dedicated professionals. When I came back in 2007, 2006, it had about 3,000 mainly managing contractors. Um, the United States doesn't even know how to do strategic communications. Let me, just, let me just give you a couple of statistics that indicate how poor we are at strategic communications. <clears throat> During the worst of the North Korean famine in the late 1990s, the United States was the biggest contributor of food aid to North Korea. And in 1998 or 1999, we gave three times as much food aid to North Korea as China did. And more than all the rest of the world put together. 
Similarly, we have spent almost $10 billion in recent years helping Syrian refugees, about half of it inside Syria, half of it outside Syria. These are all amazing secrets, and we ought to be telling everybody in the world about it. In the middle of our toughest time with Iran, there's an earthquake in Bam, Iran. The United States Air Force flies medical supplies and humanitarian stuff into Iran. Nobody knows that, including the Iranians. So we've completely dropped the ball on strategic communications. Um, and we've just forgotten how to do a lot of these things. And, and if this competition with China is to remain non-military, we actually need to rebuild uh, our non-military capabilities. And for me, that would be a very high priority in terms of our national security policy because that's the only way we're going to be able to take on the Chinese. So, so if you're going to start the rebuild, where would you start? Well, I think, first of all, the current national security structure is based on a law that was passed in 1947 to guide the United States in decision making in the Cold War against the Soviet Union. It seems to me that um, 20 years after the end of the Soviet Union, maybe we ought to take a relook at that. And so I would start with the National Security Act, and I basically would start over. And, and how would you restructure the government? I don't have answers to all these questions. What I do know is we need to completely redo the entire structure. What sense does it make in 2019 <coughs> that when the National Security Council principals meet in the Situation Room, the Secretary of the Treasury is not there, or the, or the Trade Representative, or the Secretary of Commerce, or a host of other people. And how do you structure these non-military instruments to be effective? Because what we do have isn't very effective. So I think, I think there's a, first of all, needs to be a structural, um, uh, uh, we have to redo the National Security Act, but then we also need to make some organizational changes within the government, and I think, I think the place to start is probably the State Department, and, and the trade-off I would make is basically telling the career folks at the State Department, we basically have to recreate this or organization. You can't have an organization that has 32 or 35 bureaus and all these special envoys and all these special assistants and everything else, and you can't keep doing assistance the way we've been doing assistance. We're gonna have to completely redo the way this department works, the way people get promoted, uh, accountability and so on, and the trade-off is the department will get the money it needs to do the job. The Department of State's been starved of resources for 25 years. And every time we came up with a need where the money ought to go, a, a non-military need, like police training in Afghanistan, that the State Department's responsible for, the Congress didn't give the State Department the money to do it. They shoveled it over to the Defense Department, which isn't trained or uh, statutorily supposed to be doing this kind of stuff. So the trade-off is, you know, you basically, I think, have to have a major restructuring of the State Department, but it also needs the, the promise for those who care about it is we're going to, once again, the State Department will become the hub of the implementation of American foreign policy, and it will be properly funded. Yes, sir. One other topic that's become a major focus area in not just national security, but actually domestic security, homeland security, is cybersecurity. Well, what does success look like in cybersecurity? Well, I think, I think first of all, I, I would put it in two categories. Success looks like being able to protect our infrastructure and and being able to, um, and helping companies develop ex the tools they need to defend themselves. Uh, we did this on a limited basis when I was secretary in 2010. Uh, <clears throat> we went to a number of uh, defense industries 
And we do a pretty good job of defending the classified uh, dot mill world. We don't do anything in the dot com uh, uh, or dot gov world. But we do do a pretty good job in dot mill. And, and if you give us the information we need on a voluntary basis, we will extend the umbrella of coverage and protection over you so that the Chinese and others don't steal all of our secrets of stuff you're building for us. So I think figuring out how to expand that umbrella uh, in a public-private partnership kind of thing is important. So first, um, protecting our infrastructure. Second, helping business to defend itself. And then third, going back to something I was talking about earlier, um, being able to defend ourselves against attempts using cyber to disrupt our democracy and our public dialogue, <clears throat> to discredit individuals, and ways somehow, um, and maybe AI, is one of the solutions to quickly identify and publicize um, things that have been put into our system falsely by the Soviets or the Russians or the Chinese or uh, somebody else that would quickly identify this is, this is a foreign intrusion. You published three books and you're working on your fourth. Your first one was about the Cold War and the role of presidents and the intelligence community and government in, in fighting that war. Your second one was about your time as Secretary of Defense. And your third one was about your experience at Defense Department, CIA, and Texas A&M University. And you compare and contrast the, the, the ways you manage organizations between those three. I thought they're all, they're all fascinating. For students out here who are starting their own book collections, which one should they read first? <laughs> <laughs> Probably the cheapest one. <laughs> uh, I would say, I would say, uh, probably the leadership book because it really is about how, at any level of an organization, you can successfully bring change and reform. And, and, and really, my, here, my experience here at A&M was very important in terms of how do you balance the preservation of traditions and culture that are the heart and the soul of the organization while you lead it into the future and make the changes that are needed for it to be successful in a very different kind of world. And, and in a way, the, the challenge was very similar in the military and at CIA. All three of these institutions that I've led and the Boy Scouts have a very deep culture and a deep resistance to change. And figuring out how to thread the needle because you want to make, even if you've got a great organization, if, if you don't keep moving it forward, everybody who's been in business knows that if you're not changing, you're dying. And so you've got to keep moving forward and adapting and adjusting to the future. So how best do you do that on its own merits, but then how do you do that and preserve what it is that actually made the institution great in the first place? And one of the interesting things, if you do read the books in order, is that you, in my view, you see the growth and change of the author. Um, you, have, you look at the organizations differently. It, it becomes a different uh, solution set that you develop. The way you motivate and inspire the people in the organization seems to change. Uh, I thought it was fascinating, and, uh, but all of them are wonderful. The titles, again, if you're writing them down, From the Shadows, <laughs> Duty, and a passion for leadership. And the uh, secretary didn't ask me to say that. <laughs> but that's what they are. Um, sir, I'm going to give you the last couple of minutes, if, if you'd like them, uh, to say anything you want. But this is an audience that's incredibly appreciative of your service uh, in so many different ways. Uh, is, tell us anything you can about whether you'd do it again, why you would do it again. 
what are the things that made you and your family proud in this journey? Well, I think, um, I think that the thing that, particularly at, uh, here at A&M and at the Defense Department, because I did grow in, uh, in these jobs, um, was giving, giving the people on the front lines whether in the trenches in Afghanistan or Iraq or students and faculty here at A&M, um, the sense that, that the person leading the organization really cared about them and <clears throat> genuinely wanted them uh, to be safe and to be successful. And, uh, I mean, I told the soldiers, I said, I regard all of you as though you were my own sons and daughters, and I will do anything to protect you uh, and to bring you home safe. And, and the response years later, as those people come up to me, is pretty remarkable. Uh, when you have a, a young man come up to you, as I did last night at a veterans event in Houston, and so one of the big things I did to protect the troops was deploy this mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicle, MRAP. And he came up, he kind of put his finger in my chest, and he said, your MRAP saved my life. Hard to beat that. Can't beat that. Hard to beat that. Uh, as a father, I want to thank you. Two of my children were students here when you were the president. The night you announced to the student body that you were leaving, one of them called me at 1.30 in the morning with me instantly thinking, oh no, what's he done now? <laughs> <laughs> and he said he was very upset because President Gates was leaving Texas A&M. Who gets that kind of reaction from students at a major university? Yeah. That, that blew me away. But I had the privilege of serving with you in the Pentagon. So I have, I have photographs from the most remote parts of Iraq and Afghanistan, standing with Aggie officers mm -hmm. holding an A&M flag. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the perfect place to end. Please <laughs> help me thank Secretary Gates for being here. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mark. Thank you, sir. Thank you very, very much.